Good afternoon, depending on your time zone, and uh, welcome to this uh, panel of Kamka Week 2020, which is titled Afghanistan. What comes first, peace, trade, or bullet together? My name is Zafar Hashimi, and uh, in this panel I have with me, it's a privilege to have Shwa Ibrahim, Senior Advisor for Ministry of Peace of Afghanistan and a member of the Kamka Network. Uh, I have also uh, Dr. Saib Orzala Ashraf Nemat, who is Director of the Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit, or also known locally as ARU. Uh, Ambassador Nasir Andesha, Permanent Representative of Afghanistan to the United Nations Office at Geneva. And last but definitely not least, I have Dr. Uh, Vanda Philbaugh Brown, who is a Senior Fellow uh, on Foreign Policy Program Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence at the Brookings Institutions. Uh, before going into the questions format, I wanna just put a disclaimer that whatever I say here today will be only my personal views and not that of my employer. So on the Afghan peace process and its perspectives and prospects, so far we know that the formation of a new High Peace Council and the agreement between uh, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah and President Ashraf Ghani ended the political crisis in Afghanistan. We also know that the Qatar has agreed to host the first round of the inter-Afghan dialogue and the signs are there that the Afghan government and the Taliban have also agreed to hold the first round over there, but the technical details are yet to come out and we're hoping to get some uh, in this panel through our uh, friend who works in the Afghan Ministry of Peace. Uh, we also know that the level of violence across Afghanistan have increased dramatically. Uh, the Afghan forces are still at a uh, defensive mood uh, and we don't know how long they will continue to be holding that position and start not to start uh, their offensive uh, operations. Uh, U.S., Russia, and Afghanistan recently had some, some rounds of talks, and there's a statement that supports an Afghan-owned and Afghan-led peace process, and we would like to have a definition of that Afghan-owned, Afghan-led uh, process uh, in this panel as to what it means now. Uh, what we want to know specifically in this panel is what's happening right now in terms of uh, beginning of the preparations for the talk uh, between Afghans, uh, Afghan government, the civil society, as well as the Taliban. Uh, and when is actually that going to take place? There were news that is going to, uh, those first rounds of talk are going to happen uh, within a week or so. Who influences the agenda the most? Uh, is it the Afghan government, the Taliban, and who else? Uh, what are the roles of the other stakeholders in the peace process, in the Afghan peace process, uh, regional countries, uh, big powers, and particularly uh, the US, and what role it's going to play, whether it's going to be a mediator, uh, one of the sides of the conflicts, and what is the current polls in Washington, given the upheals that's ha taking place across the US with the uh, domestic issues and domestic policies. And last, uh, we would try to get a uh, role and um, involvement and interest of other regional countries, particularly uh, in the spirit of this uh, panel, uh, which is the role of Kamka countries and uh, their interests in Afghanistan, whether it's true uh, their concerns at the border like Tajikistan, increased interest in the regional politics like Uzbekistan, or other countries that are interested to have a peaceful Afghanistan to increase their trade and commerce activities. On the format of the panel, uh, each panelist will get 10 minutes uh, for their presentation and introductory remarks. Then we'll do some uh, follow-up question and answers. And at the last portion of the uh, panel, we will get to you, uh, our audience, specifically our Kamka fellows across uh, the region and the world, wherever you are. Uh, you can send us your questions using the Q&A portion in this uh, uh, Zoom meeting. 
without further ado, we'll just go straight to Shwai Brahim to give us an update of the preparations on the Afghan government side uh, as to where we are and uh, what's happening right now. Shwai? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Zafar, for that introduction. I'm very honored to be part of this prestigious panel today. Uh, in my remarks and limited time today, um, I would like to do two things. First, I want to set up and frame the discussion um, with a forward-looking approach. Um, and second, um, uh, I'd like to talk about some of the major dynamics um, which will play an important role in the upcoming uh, direct negotiations. Um, hopefully, I will, um, I will try to do so providing as much updates as, as I'm allowed to. Um, so to start off, I would like to take us back about four months, uh, give or take, um, and set up the premise of my remarks starting with February 29th uh, of this year, uh, 2020. Um, on that day, two important events took place. First was the joint declaration between the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan and the United States for bringing peace in Afghanistan. Uh, the joint de declaration was significant for a, few, for a few reasons. First, because it reaffirmed the standing of the government of Afghanistan and basically the Republic with the United States and our international partners, particularly highlighting the legitimacy and global recognition of this state as opposed to um, the Taliban Political Commission. This was important not only to address internal fears due to the progress made uh, uh, in the Doha negotiations, but also partly because of the precedent set by the Geneva Accords in the late 80s, um, which was and is um, a source of concern for the general population when they look at the, uh, look at the current process. Uh, second, in this joint declaration, the significance is because the government took note of the progress made on the peace process, particularly the Doha Agreement, and reaffirmed its commitment to the process to move towards ending the war. The commitment was made in the presence of the diverse political actors in the country, demonstrating a relative consensus on the peace process. We now see that that consensus has evolved and that, and that the political spectrum is more, much more unified than um, it was um, at that point in time. The third importance of the joint declaration is because it prepares us for the reality of a post-US withdrawal in Afghanistan. This means that the political elite and the system in Afghanistan is no longer under a delusion that the presence of international troops and US troops will continue as is for an um, uh, indefinite period of time. So this joint declaration codified that acceptance and also demonstrated a level of preparation for that reality. It did this by highlighting the U.S. commitment towards supporting the Afghan National Security Forces uh, uh, post-settlement, the U.S. facilitation between Afghanistan and Pakistan, a very important regional dynamic, and the continuation of joint effort to prevent the use of Afghanistan soil by terrorists against the U.S. and its allies. One of the main reasons, if not the main reason, um, why the United States and NATO came into Afghanistan in the first place. So it was a very forward-looking declaration, cognizant of almost the tectonic shifts um, that would take place post-withdrawal, very deliberate, well thought out to the best of everyone's ability, and negotiated in, in, uh, in good faith while understanding and recognizing the limitations um, that are brought about by domestic politics in the United States. A few hours after the joint declaration, we had the signing of the Doha Agreement between the United States and the Taliban Political Commission, which outlined uh, four elements, one of which was the start of the direct negotiations between the Taliban and the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Unfortunately, um, for reasons that are unknown to me, uh, at least, the automatic release of 5,000 Taliban prisoners became an added precondition by the Taliban. Um, this was a precondition which uh, the United States, our United States uh, U.S. partners emphasized on heavily and pretty much de facto committed to, uh, committed to as well. Um, 
I'm not sure what was written. I haven't read the secret annexes. I'm not sure what's written there. Um, uh, but basically, the general feel from everybody and the main objection by the Afghan state was that um, this commitment went beyond the jurisdiction of that agreement. Um, and uh, this precondition of the release of 5,000 prisoners complicated an already delicate and vulnerable process. So the question is, um, where is the process today? Um, thankfully, we have positive momentum, moving very, uh, very much closer to the start of the direct talks. The negotiation team of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan is fully ready and prepared to begin in terms of not just substance, but positions, preparations, training, uh, in, internal unity, and the political uh, legitimacy of the negotiating team. This is important because this was not necessarily the case um, earlier in the year. Um, second, uh, demonstrating goodwill, the government has released up to an over 3,000 Taliban prisoners, um, which has been recognized by the Taliban political office. Prisoners have also been released, um, which were held by the, uh, by the Taliban. This demonstrates progress as well. And third, um, as slightly alluded to earlier, considering the COVID-19 travel restric restrictions, the starting venue for the uh, first round of the direct talks have been agreed to be um, uh, in Doha, Qatar. The follow-up and next rounds of talks is a completely separate matter, and these discussions are still ongoing. Um, and whenever they're finalized, I'm sure the public and all of you um, um, will get to be made aware of it. So. Uh, now the second part of my uh, remarks. What are the major dynamics which will shape the direct negotiations between the delegations representing the Islamic Republic of, of, of uh, Afghanistan and the Taliban? So what are, what, are the, uh, what are the influencing factors? Not necessarily the agenda. The agenda, of course, issues like the ceasefire, issues of power sharing, issues, issues of the uh, uh, integrity of, of the republic and the constitutional order, all, uh, 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 issues of addressing grievances, all these issues have been discussed as um, any conflict has to go through these. So uh, with considering the context of the uh, Afghan conflict, it, they might, there might be the drug war, there might be um, uh, a few uh, agenda items more or less, but essentially the pool of items um, uh, is somewhat identified. But the major dynamics need to be understood because those will influence uh, the, the negotiating room. The, the first is that we have to recognize that we're operating in an environment, in an environment with massive, uh, with a massive trust deficit. Now, this trust deficit exists among um, uh, pretty much all parties. Um, the U.S. domestic political situation is volatile. We're not sure about the unpredictability there. The increase of violence uh, questions the genuine intention of the Taliban towards the talks. The second major dynamic is that there's a fundamental difference among Afghan society's value systems and the Taliban. Our society has evolved uh, due to the exposure in the past two decades. Uh, we want to see it at the table globally, but the Taliban are stuck in the past. That's, that's the general understanding. Um, the maintaining and preserving the constitutional order and fundamental rights will, will, will shape the foundations of our approach to these negotiations. Um, third, Afghanistan's role in the region post-US withdrawal. Now, how Afghanistan will form its relationship with our neighboring countries and the region um, will have to either explicitly or implicitly come out of these talks. What's been very clear is that the region does not want a return of the emirate of the Taliban, which is, which is a positive signal and I think an important common position. Fourth, the issue of economic development in a post-settlement Afghanistan, implementing any settlement without donor support um, uh, is unrealistic, expecting it to be implemented. Sustaining a settlement after reaching one, which is already uh, complicated, will not be realistic without having the commitment of donor support. And the final dynamic is the issue of spoilers. There are clearly parties which want to see the complete process fail. Afghanistan and the government are committed, although we have our reservations, we're committed to see the process through to reach somewhere because we realize that the withdrawal will change the regional dynamics and the dynamics of power within the country. Um, so having said that, these are the dynamics I think which will influence the negotiations. Um, and um, I will stop there and uh, pass it back to you, Zafar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, speaking of spoilers, um, 
and the right components being there to start the inter-Afghan dialogues. Uh, are, are we there yet, as uh, I would like now to ask Dr. Arzak Orzala to give her presentation with these thoughts in mind with what uh, Shwaib said uh, about the Afghan government being ready and accepting of all major uh, conditions while the messages that are we, that are we getting, uh, including the one that President Ghani had last week uh, at, in his talks, are saying the other, uh, the other way around. So floor is yours virtually. Thank you, uh, um, Good day, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rumsfeld Foundation, for organizing and facilitating this talk, uh, virtual talk. Um, so um, the, uh, whether we are there or not uh, is very much volatile these days, because there is one day that we are getting closer to some kind of a realistic plan. There, are, There is another day that we are switching back to an offensive uh, position, even militarily speaking. Um, I think um, 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 I will go a little bit, uh, with permission of everyone in the panels, I will go a little bit back to see so far what uh, has been done there uh, and the place of Afghanistan as a whole, as a nation and as a republic or as a country in general. Um, if, uh, there is a, in, if there is an international recognition of a factional group who use terrorism as a means to achieve its goals. If there is a recognition for them, there should be recognition for the remaining 30 million people and somewhat a weak and fragile and shaking government, but still a government or a state that represents them. Unfortunately, in the first phase of this uh, so-called peace process, I would call it, uh, we have seen no uh, presence of Afghanistan. Uh, yes, there were protocol level, you know, um, meetings back and forth, but no Afghan other than the Taliban, if we assume for a moment that Taliban are also Afghans, but no Afghan other than the Taliban were present in the room when the signatory event or ceremony happened, including to our information and those of you involved with the journalists can say even including Afghan journalists, they were not allowed in the room. So that in itself portrays some level of concern when it comes uh, to whether this is a peace process for Afghanistan or is it an exit strategy for the United States of America uh, to begin with. So there is that, that uh, realization. If uh, you watch over the process without being part of the process yourself. So uh, I think that uh, raises a lot of uh, sort of concerns for us. Although we see that in times there is much more efforts from the time it began uh, than the time that it concluded, there were at least some uh, attempts and efforts from all sides to sort of repair this, you know, absence of Afghans from the talks with the Taliban, uh, the rest of Afghans. So I would not even go to the gender dimension of it because, well, if the whole of the Afghanistan was not present, then let alone the women uh, who were not uh, present there. Uh, now, when it comes to um, where we are now, uh, following to Mr. Rahim's uh, 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 remarks uh, in terms of preparations politically after months of disputes and problems with the government formation and all that, we are there. Uh, symbolically speaking, there is one negotiation team and hopefully, hopefully this negotiation team will be the one uh, kicking off the intra-Afghan dialogue. Uh, now, the approach that the Afghan government and the rest of the political elites in the country are taking from the very beginning up until now, I, I see minor but not major changes in it, is that this whole process is more about power sharing and less it appears to be about an actual peace, absence of violence or immediate ceasefire. The immediate ceasefire slogan or call comes from people who are burned and hurt by this conflict. From Helmand to Badakhshan, from Kandahar to uh, Nengahar from, you know, Mazar to Herat, everyone where, including Kabul, which had some miserable uh, incidents in the latest uh, weeks um, and continues to have, you know, incidents ac all across. Um, I think the call, that call is really powerful about ceasefire and immediate end of violence. Unfortunately, neither from the Taliban side and nor from the government side have we seen uh, evidences that shows that there is a serious uh, concentration of uh, reduction in violence. I mean, we are not 
talking about ceasefire here, but reduction. Uh, the re there were some news uh, in information uh, in the last couple of days, which indicated that uh, the, the so-called reduction in violence or RIV that is counted based on the uh, international monitoring uh, systems cannot really uh, match what is happening on the ground because yes, they are not attacks probably on the military bases. Yes, they are not attacks probably directly uh, targeting, you know, uh, certain international or national institutions, but they are ongo ongoing operations and that, that people are being killed. So we see concern, concerning level, uh, less evidence that indicates that this process will result to an actual peace. So it's really important to sort of make a note of that so that we have, we set our expectation more realistically. There are very, so far, very little evidence. This whole notion of, and I'm sure in this uh, platform, we have experts more than myself to discuss about, you know, what it means to have some incidents very similar to the one typically claimed by Taliban that are not claimed by Taliban. What does it mean? I mean, I would let that for, uh, for other experts in the room to uh, sort of discuss about. But from, from, uh, from, our, from my perspective personally, I think uh, it's the time in the intra-Afghan dialogue phase to move on from the power sharing, let the power sharing part to be one uh, uh, phase of the overall discussions about the content of how to really bring a, a sustainable peace in the country, whether it means uh, addressing the, uh, the violations that happen on all sides, on which my organization and myself have been really working hard to sort of come up with concrete, you know, uh, recommendations and suggestions, or is it about, you know, the development, the future of the development assistance in the country and how to sort of focus on, you know, uh, reparations and, you know, reintegration in the society of the combats and all that, or is it about, you know, migration and addressing those issues? So issues, I think, are critical and if the peace talks is only about a ceremonial um, events that are just, you know, about handshaking or based on the current social distancing, just, you know, the hand raising kind of an arrangement. This is not uh, something that uh, brings any optimism to us, but if it is more opening the space for an actual lasting uh, opportunity, I think then uh, we can expect um, uh, more uh, on this. A couple of uh, further points uh, in relation with the role of the regional powers, and then I move uh, quickly on the trading part because I think the topic is also um, uh, sort of covering the, the, the trade and the relation with the peace. Uh, with regards to the regions um, and the global, as Mr. Rahim also mentioned, luckily we have at least a level of consensus among the US, uh, um, the, uh, the, the Russian uh, coming up with a joint statement. We hope to see the same. Uh, level of commitment from our immediate neighbors, Iran and Pakistan, with whom we have actually trading issues right now. We have um, actually human rights issues right now with Iran, with the two uh, major inc incidents happening. Uh, Afghans were um, uh, injured, uh, tortured and put on the rivers and then a uh, car a vehicle was, was um, targeted and burned with, with people in them. Uh, so these are two major incidents that are sort of uh, creating a lot of diplomatic tensions between us and Iran as we speak. So that's like one story. And with Pakistan, of course, uh, last week we had the military team from Pakistan coming and visiting our civilian government. So uh, that in itself gives you a sort of a message. So regional consensus, particularly the two major neighbors who are, who are one way or another being involved of in, in this conflict, uh, directly or uh, through proxies is really critical to also give a level higher level of um, assurance to this process being successful. Uh, we cannot ignore the role of Pakistan, we cannot ignore the role of Iran and many other countries that are involved. When it comes to trading, um, I think that's the other side of the whole peace and what peace me really means. Uh, uh, and as I said, it's, peace is not definitely an event, a ceremonial sort of a theatrical um, uh, event as it sort of appears in some people's mind and probably it's suitable for some people. But for Afghans, a, a real peace is a time when A, violence is gone and violence is not the means to sort of uh, speak to each other and B, that there are feasible opportunities, economic and trading. We are a trading country. We are a trading nation, historically speaking. 
And now the war has affected our trades uh, sort of significantly. And so the ability to recreate that and to bring the trading uh, networks activated within the region and beyond the region is, is another way that we can sort of uh, look into it. Um, I'll stop here and then maybe I'll come back when uh, there's... All right, thank you very much. Um... Role, speaking of role of the regional countries, particularly in this panel, we have audience from across uh, Kamka or Central Asia, Caucasus, including, uh, but also Mongolia, who are listening right now to us. So please, our audience, uh, take the opportunity, raise your concerns, ask your questions in the question and answer part, and we'll try to address them. Uh, later in the panel. Now I would move on to uh, Ambassador Nasir Ahmad Andesha, Afghanistan's permanent representative in Geneva to talk about the uh, framework as a whole uh, that are in, that's in use in Afghanistan to pursue a peace talk, whether or not it has the components as Dr. Urzala said, that it has the symbolism attached to it as opposed to real substantial Peace. What, what, what are the successful stories of other countries and other experiences that Afghanistan is using or not using? Uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it to Ambassador Andesha. Well, thank you very much, uh, Zafar, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, greetings, and assalamu alaikum to all uh, participants and, and our audience across, across the world. I um, I think the points that I wanted to touch uh, uh, upon at the beginning was, was already discussed, so I will just brush through them, which is the issue of process versus substance of, of negotiation. And the assumptions that we have, uh, some of the positions and the interest of the parties, and then the opportunities and the risk, both at the domestic and the regional uh, level. Um, and if time permits, maybe I'll touch upon some of the lessons that we learned from our history. So in terms of, uh, of what we are discussing uh, uh, right now, I'll just uh, uh, make also a disclaimer the way that you did, that you know, my points not necessarily represents the position of Afghanistan Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I can speak mostly you know, as, a, as a concerned Afghan citizen, but also as somebody who has done some research in this area of regional uh, cooperation, regional integration, but also governance in Afghanistan. So basically we are now in the middle of the process, but we are in the middle with some certain assumptions that we have about, about the preconditions of a peace process being in place. Of course, you know, I don't want to go back being a very sort of pessimist person and to keep you know, challenging all the assumptions that we have. And one of the most important assumptions of any peace process uh, is that there is a military stalemate and we are heading toward a peace process because the, uh, you know, the the belligerents, uh, they, they have a rich understanding that there is no, no way out for them in terms of complete military success or military uh, 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 victory in this. I think this is one assumption that we are, we are working on. I understand that, you know, General McLister and, and the others, they put this forward that we are, you know, we are in a situation of uh, 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 still, but Taliban would say that, you know, we are in a statement with the United States of America, not, not, not with the others. So, but, that's, that's, I think, one thing. And the other thing is that, that the parties are thinking that, you know, we will reach our goals uh, through a peaceful mean, which is negotiation. Again, you know, there are lots of doubts in this, that if, especially the Taliban are believing that, you know, we are going to reach our goals and if we, if we understand what, they, what their goals are. So, uh, so if we take this, if we take this, this uh, uh, as a fact that, okay, you know, we take this as a fact, we are somewhere, as Shraib said, that, we're already in the middle, a sort of a, a framework agreement has been reached by you know, United States and the Taliban on, on 29th of February. And we, as, you know, as Afghan government and Afghans, we are basically working under the umbrella of an agreement which has already been done there and we have not been uh, a party to it. So it means that, that you know, we are also uh, um, having a, a limited uh, uh, space for maneuver to go about. But then if you, if you look at it uh, in, in a more uh, you know, uh, uh, optimistic way, which I wanted to, want, I wanted to be, is that, that this opens, this situation right now, opens a very important uh, window of opportunity. If I can call it this like a, an open moment 
uh, for many reforms and restructuring and the adjustments that, that was supposed, that was overdue in the past couple of years, especially in the past 10 years, uh, to make you know, both uh, the polity in Afghanistan, but also the society, uh, in you know, changing it in a way, and also our relation with the region, to, to put us in a better course for you know, the, the, the third decade of the 21st century. Because you know, this country has seen, has seen a lot. So I mean, there is an opportunity. And this, an oppor this opportunity then requires a lot of courage you know, and a lot of you know, open-mindedness to be ready to put you know, an enormous amount of uh, reforms, uh, both in our domestic politics and our government system, but also in our, in our foreign relations and, and our trade relations in the Big Kingdom. So I think this is, this is uh, the two things which, you know, in terms of the relations of uh, trade relations, I'll come back and I'll, and I'll touch, and this is where the CAMCA and all this will come. In terms of the process versus substance, uh, Shrai also mentioned, and you know, some, some points, uh, um, uh, Dr. Urzela has mentioned that, 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 you know, some of the substances of this negotiation is, is known. And I will call it that, that basically that's, that's not very known because we, at least at this level, or at least I'm, I'm far away, we think that we know that what the others are thinking. This is basically the thing, of course. Uh, 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 in terms of the negotiations, positions are not the, uh, necessarily representing the, the interest. So there is a position and then beyond the position, there is an interest. I think we have to go and beyond the positions and we have to reach you know, where the interest is and to see you know, how we can bring these interests closer with each other. This is where we, we might reach you know, the point of, in a point of agreement. And we also should understand that, that that's why the process is very important. I think I wanted to focus. I don't know how much we have gone in terms of the process. Again, what I see from here, we don't have a proper process where all this you know, sequencing is done and then you know, the fallouts, the, uh, uh, the detours and everything has been, uh, has been talked about. Because uh, process is, as I said, as important as, as the substance because the process is the one which will lead, which we can put the substance and then we can agree on, on the points that it's easy at the beginning and then we can, we can go about it. So in terms of the process also, I think we have, we have to be really careful and we have to calibrate a process which is tailor made for a situation uh, like, like the one in Afghanistan, which again, the previous speakers mentioned about the doubts and all these things. I think it's not the only question of power sharing, it's a question of uh, uh, the interest and also beyond, I mean, what makes this interest is the personalities, you know, the emotions attached to these things. All of these things are very important that we have to, we have to, you know, uh, uh, look at very carefully when, uh, you know, when we are, when we are uh, moving, moving forward. So uh, basically, when so if we put all of this, all of this together, I think we we need to, we need to basically be very mindful of 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 the process and also the sequencing of of this process and then how the substance can be put into this process in a way can, can lead us to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to a way forward or to a solution. And then of course, there is question of implementation and, and, and the other things. And now I'll come to, I'll come to, the, to the regional point. So I, as I said, that in the, domestic, in, the, in the domestic politics of Afghanistan, what was termed as a power sharing, I'll call it a restructure of the system, uh, and the governance, this, the, the, the structure of polity, but also, the way that the governance uh, or governing uh, is happening, the delivery of services uh, to, to the population. I think we have to be ready to, to, to work seriously on this, which will mean that we have to open the constitution for it or other mechanisms. But at the same time, I will leave that you know, for the questions and answers and for the people who might be more uh, um, qualified to discuss that. But I will come to the regional one. In terms of the region, I think what we need to prepare ourselves in terms of the region is, that that say that we have to basically be ready to make some of these changes in a way in a way that we should have a friendly but equally engaged region so in the sense that when it comes to the trade and commerce we have to be very engaged we have to be so engaged you know integrated into the economy especially in the economy of central asia Azerbaijan and all this, you know, Kafkas region where because there's enormous projects, you know, from one belt road 
to not sell carriers to all these, you know, major economic, uh, let alone this, you know, Tapi and Kaza and the others are going on. And there's an enormous interest for this region. And I'm in very close contact with the ambassadors of Central Asia and Greater Central Asia region, the Caucasus region. They understand that, that, you know, question of peace in Afghanistan is fundamental to, to unlocking, you know, the potential of this region economic potential of this region and reducing their vulnerability and also their independent, interdependent to, to China, to Russia, and to, to many other things. So they understand, I think they have a huge stake in this. But the question is that can, can this region can come together and stay behind the Afghanistan's peace process? Because if we all come together, then a fundamentalist extremist group like Taliban in the all of Central Asia and the Caucasus will be in a small piece. But if it's only left for Afghanistan, it's an enormous challenge. So I think this is part of the border sharing and, and, and burden sharing and challenge sharing. So but in this, in this uh, uh, line, then it comes uh, the question of which kind of a regional mechanism and regional uh, basically agreement we need to go parallel or to complement the, the, the supposed you know, peace agreement. If we can think a little bit ahead, which we're hoping that you know, we reach a peace agreement. So this peace agreement needs uh, to have need to have a, a regional consensus. Will it be in terms of an agreement of non-aggression and neutrality, some sort of things, you know, that that it will enable Afghanistan and the region that to work with each other. So there should be something, some responsibilities for Afghanistan, but also mm -hmm. some, you know, uh, uh, interest. At the same time, uh, the same will go for the region. So the region has to see that their interest is balanced in Afghanistan. And in terms of the politics, and in terms of the politics, Afghanistan has to keep equal proximity with everyone. But in terms of the military and you know, security issues around the world, Afghanistan has to stay neutral. And I think that agreement outside and a, and a social contract inside the country can sustain you know, a peace, which hopefully we are going to reach if all these assumptions are, are that we are working is, is, is correct as in place. So I think I will stop in here. And then probably we'll take on in terms of the uh, regional dimension if there was any question. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Andisha. Uh, for our audience, uh, the Q&A section, not the chat section, the chat section is still closed, but the Q&A section is open for your questions. Uh, and taking it from region to the uh, global level, uh, I would go to Dr. Uh, Vanda Fulbaugh brown and to give us her perspective as to what's happening. And we'll start from what's happening in DC in terms of uh, Afghanistan and what's the pulse over there. It's all yours, uh, Doctor. Well, um, thank you. Uh, good day, good morning to everyone else. Um, I too uh, need to emphasize that I am uh, speaking uh, as an individual and not speaking on behalf of um, any organization that I am a member of. United States has fundamentally shaped the developments in Afghanistan over the past uh, two decades. It's been a principal architect mover of uh, the political dispensation that Afghanistan uh, has had after uh, 2001 with US invasion of Afghanistan to depose the Taliban regime. Uh, but as uh, Dr. Rahim said, the United States is on its way out. The uh, February 29th deal is a deal about how the U.S. leaves uh, Afghanistan with uh, the principal U.S. interest uh, assured. The principal U.S. interest being that Afghanistan is not used um, for terrorist attacks against the United States or U.S. allies, uh, and that groups um, uh, do not operate, terrorist groups do not operate uh, in the country for that purpose. Nonetheless, the United States would very much want to see um, that after its departure, Afghanistan becomes a peaceful country. I wish I could say that Afghanistan remains a peaceful country. We are not there. The uh, civil war in the country is intense and intensifying. Um, uh, the previous speaker spoke um, eloquently about the level of violence that's taking place. So the United States sought to put in uh, the agreed deal uh, at least some provisions that would allow um, for a chance for a negotiated agreement between the Taliban and the Afghan government, and really between the Taliban and the numerous set of political power 
uh, poles uh, in Afghanistan, some of which uh, are represented uh, in the uh, Afghan government and others which are not. Although now the establishment of the unity government between uh, uh, Dr. Ashraf Ghani and uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah uh, gives perhaps a, a better chance that there is more of a unity or at least a, a mechanism uh, to work toward unity uh, in uh, uh, the various poles of powers in Afghanistan as the negotiations with the Taliban will hopefully get underway. Uh, I very strongly welcome uh, the hope that negotiations will start soon. Uh, the sooner the process starts, the better. One key reason of that is, of course, that um, the United States is committed to withdraw all of its forces from Afghanistan by summer of next year. Uh, it, has already, uh, it has already exceeded the schedule of withdrawal of U.S. forces from where it were uh, to reach um, in July uh, 2020, so in just a few days. The U.S. is ahead of that. The question is how fast the rest of the troops leave. The agreement has four parts, and as Dr. Rahim mentioned, uh, one of which is that a uh, intra-Afghan negotiations start. But it is a major question for uh, the U.S. government whether it believes that um, uh, it is committed or obligated to stay um, even if the negotiations don't start. And certainly President Trump uh, has not been secret at all that he doesn't read the agreement this way and uh, that he has multiple times instructed uh, members of his government to withdraw all of U.S. troops by no the uh, November elections of this year, the U.S. presidential uh, elections. Uh, it is unlikely that U.S. troops will all be out by that time, uh, but uh, it is very possible that the order will be given, which would mean that U.S. troops would leave Afghanistan uh, by earlier than the specified uh, uh, July uh, uh, 2021 deadline. Not um, everyone uh, in the U.S. policy circles agrees with the speed of that um, uh, withdrawal. Uh, many are afraid and would uh, oppose a situation that looks like U.S. withdrawal from Syria. Uh, That's a frightening prospect for everyone and should be a very distressing prospect for Afghanistan as well. But nonetheless, there is really no public political uh, belief anymore in the country that the United States should stay in any kind of prolonged military deployment. Uh, if uh, President Trump is not re-elected in November and instead former Vice President Biden uh, is elected, uh, I don't expect that uh, the policy on withdrawal from Afghanistan will radically change. It might change by some months, but it will not be fundamentally different. Vice President Biden has long um, specified um, that uh, the U.S. should have much more limited engagement uh, in uh, Afghanistan when he was vice president. He uh, was not a fan of the surge uh, under the Obama administration. And um, even beyond what were his politics then, the U.S. has simply fundamentally uh, rethought its uh, global priorities which clearly um, have become, um, again, focus on China and Russia, and very strong sense that uh, what uh, some people refer to as forever wars uh, or uh, um, military engagements that are fundamentally about uh, local terrorist groups or even terrorist groups with global reach and local political power arrangements are not what should be the focus of U.S. policy, and certainly not with the means of extensive military uh, deployment. I again want to also highlight something very important that uh, Dr. Rahim said, which is um, that um, th this, this understanding of uh, the U.S. increasingly limited and declining interest in Afghanistan is something that has often not been appreciated uh, by um, uh, the country's uh, people and by Afghanistan's uh, power elites, many of whom believe that the U.S. will simply stay committed in Afghanistan forever and shape their uh, behavior, shape their approaches to the Afghan government, to the uh, international community on that basis. 
uh, what would often be said is that the United States uh, sees Afghanistan as an epicenter, uh, as, a, as a key fulcrum uh, of um, uh, the prosecution of a new great game in Central Asia, where the United States seeks to compete for resources, power projection, access with Russia and the China. So this notion of new uh, great game that took um, hold uh, among Afghan uh, political Afghan, Afghan politicians and, and power brokers structured much thinking. And I hope that at this point, this uh, what Dr. Rahim called delusion. Uh, which I also would um, phrase that way, is no longer there. Afghanistan is on its own. Um, that doesn't mean that Afghanistan doesn't have friends. It doesn't mean that the United States will be um, cutting off um, military aid to Afghanistan or civilian aid. Although in March, uh, we saw uh, Secretary Pompeo, the US Secretary of State, being willing to make a truly an unprecedented threat of cutting one billion of dollars to Afghanistan this year and another uh, billion next year, had there not been um, some sort of resolution of the uh, contestation over presidency uh, been reached. And that was really unprecedented that the US would issue that level of threat. Um, nonetheless, uh, there is expectation and commitment in the US Congress that US economic aid, military aid uh, will continue. But the timelines are really significant. Um, if you look at other processes of negotiations uh, that are relevant, we will see a very different timeline of the timeline of US withdrawal and how long political negotiations take place. Uh, the Afghan government has repeatedly focused on negotiations in Colombia and tried to make them the model of negotiations. Um, and in many ways, the uh, Colombian negotiating process was quite exemplary in uh, the way that it handled um, representation of various segments of the Colombian society, Afro-Colombians, women's group, and produced a 300-page uh, document of um, extraordinarily detail and level on multiple issue areas that the Colombian government is now exceedingly struggling to implement. But the process took four years of formal negotiations and several years of quiet preparation before those negotiations started. By the time US will long be gone. Mm -hmm. And um, fundamentally, the um, military battlefield in Colombia was stalled, like in Afghanistan, but was stalled at a much lower level of conflict. The threat that the leftist group, the FARC, could pose to the Colombian government is nothing uh, comparative to the level of uh, military potency and capacity of the Taliban. So if it took four years in Colombia, uh, it can potentially uh, take much longer uh, in Afghanistan with a very different battlefield, a battlefield that will be only worsening as U.S. troops uh, withdraw. Right. In the Philippines, uh, in the negotiations between the, between the Moros, the process took 13 years, again, under situation where um, the conditions for the Philippine government were just enormously more uh, advantageous to the government than anything that is the case in Afghanistan. Sure. In Nepal, after eight years of war that ended in a stalemate, uh, the Maoist and the Nepali Congress negotiated mm -hmm. for about five years, mm -hmm. and then the constitutional revision, fundamental constitutional revision, took another eight years, and the process of the constitutional revision really paralyzed governance in the country. So in many ways, the process took uh, uh, place over 13 years. Uh, I will leave it here in my opening remarks, but um, I just want to drive um, home uh, the, the discrepancy of the need and great advantage to striking a deal uh, while there is still some presence of U.S. military, and certainly not waiting after U.S. military leaves, uh, from the perspective of the Afghan government and Afghan people. But of course, the Taliban precisely wants to really delay the negotiations as much as possible, and before formalities, to start meaningfully negotiating a division of power only after the U.S. leaves, because it understands that it will have a much stronger hand um, at that point. 
um, the process will very likely be very lengthy. And only if the process is extraordinary reshuffling of power will the process uh, not be lengthy. The United States will not be an active military uh, participant in, on the battlefield, at least not in the way that it has been up till now. The US also should not be, and in my view cannot be, uh, a mediator. Um, a neutral country would have to take that role, but the US has influence over multiple actors in the negotiations, the Afghan government obviously, uh, other uh, power brokers in the country, and also over uh, the Taliban. And I hope that the United States will stay robustly engaged in uh, this, this background role to facilitate the deal that minimizes losses to um, human rights, to women rights, that preserves some inclusion of um, uh, not just the two principal or few principal poles of power, that preserves some inclusion for minorities. But at the end of the day, it's not going to be a deal like in Colombia, where the Colombian FARC simply agreed not to go under arrest mm -hmm. and have minimal representation in um, the government. Right. Uh, in my view, under the best circumstances that I don't think are likely, we will see something like in Nepal, where the Maoist became the dominant political uh, actor and ultimately won the government. But nonetheless, electoral processes uh, were still uh, taking place. All right, thank you very much, uh, all of our panelists, for the uh, presentations. A lot of insights, a lot of things to think about. Um, we'll just do a little uh, short Q&A among ourselves before going to the uh, participants' questions. And I will just straight go to Shua Ibrahim and uh, a few points that I took from the presentations of our panelists. So the uh, U.S. support, U.S. presence, and U.S. involvement in Afghanistan is not un, uh, unlimited. Uh, it is timed. Uh, there is urgency in the current administration to leave Afghanistan and decrease involvement to the minimum, uh, at least militarily. Uh, the agreement between U.S. and the Taliban calls for establishment or creation of a new quote-unquote Islamic government in Afghanistan and uh, the Afghan leadership specifically President Ghani last week announced that he is not into uh, uh, a mood up for creating an interim government while just a few minutes ago Hizb Islamis uh, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar said if they are not recognized as an uh, official opposition and if the government puts preconditions, like not agreeing to establish a uh, interim government, then they are not part of the uh, negotiations. How are you going to reconcile all of these contradictions? Uh, thank you very much uh, for that question, Zafar. I, I uh, very much enjoyed the comments by my fellow panelists. Um, I think it's a very important question. Now you understand how tough Afghan politics can be, just like uh, domestic politics in any country. You have to understand that, uh, I don't want to specifically talk about uh, the comment you just made, but political opportunism is a reality we deal with. Um, all parties, including the one who commented, are represented in the negotiation delegation. Um, and have been a part of the preparation. Uh, they themselves were, a, were party to a peace process uh, um, two years prior, um, about three years prior, um, and have assimilated into the Republic, essentially. Of course, so that was a, a test run, a successful test run, um, I would say. Um, but, I think what, but I think what your question implicitly alludes to um, is that we as uh, responsible, the responsible party to make sure that we get the best deal possible are trying to learn from the past. And one of the biggest lessons um, from the uh, previous peace accords, in particular Geneva, is um, whether it was by design or um, by coincidence, there was a power vacuum and no one ended up having any control, and that led to chaos. And so 
learning from that and building on that. There are deliberate attempts to ensure um, uh, sustainability of the state, ensuring continuation of uh, uh, governance, continuation of legitimate governance until this process yields a result, whatever that result might be. Um, but do so you have the luxury of time and support and the means to take that amount of time that is required or that you envision as the government to move toward that timeline with all these milestones? Again, a very, very important question, but I'd just like to point to uh, uh, Dr. Brown's uh, very, very insightful comparison to other peace processes, which took four, 13, 13 years, so on and so forth. If we are to expect realistically something to work, I think trying to reconcile between the rush and the sense of urgency of US domestic politics in the upcoming presidential election cycle versus making sure that you don't just sign a piece of paper, but you actually realistically move towards ending this conflict in a sustainable manner. The, the, the hope is that saner minds will prevail and that uh, we will make sure that progress is made, but without compromising the quality and the integrity of any settlement um, that will be the result um, of the negotiation. I hope I was able to address your question. All right, and thank you, uh, Dr. Saab Orzala Um You had some concerns uh, about the uh, signing of the agreement between the uh, US and the Taliban. And one of the clause, clauses in that agreement, as I alluded earlier, is the establishment of a new Islamic government in Afghanistan. And that will mean uh, changing everything basically from scratch and starting all over again. Um, and whatever is uh, happening in Afghanistan in terms of, you know, the current government, the political participation, the agreements, disagreements, um, is that a realistic goal to achieve given the short amount of time and the upcoming U.S. presidential elections and the now the solid firm nominees, both Republicans and Democrats, uh, alike wanting to have minimum presence in Afghanistan. Thank you. Um, I think with regards to this clause and the um, deal between the US and the Taliban, first of all, in the absence of a sovereign Afghan state to make such a commitment on behalf of the Afghan state with the Taliban by the United States of America, I think was not a fair uh, promise to make that part of a deal. Uh, but now that it has, uh, I think from the Taliban side also, they need to be consistent. Last thing I knew, or most of us knew, was that the Taliban's main focus of the war was the presence of the international military uh, forces and their operations. And now, now that we are getting closer to peace, if they are really true and genuine with their intention to really end the war and violence and come to a peace talk, and return to a peaceful life, then they should not make the, the Nizam or the political order as an excuse. I believe, uh, and we have said this time and again, I am leading a research think tank and we have done a series of studies on the Afghan constitution, for example. We are happy to provide those references, those evidence-based research that we've con conducted in a table, in a time that at least we are not scared of being blown up by bombs. So my message through this platform to the Taliban is that, you know, you stop the war. If you are confident enough that without fearing us, you can enter into a negotiation and a talk, then we are happy to discuss about the models. But to make such a promise on behalf of the 30 million population without any sort of you know, bases and grounds on that, because we are a Islamic Republic right now. What about this? It's not a Republic of something but Hasn't that been a message of the Afghan government, both this current government, the National Unity Government, and two governments of uh, former President Karzai, that uh, this is the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. We can even amend the constitutions with the provisions that the constitution has. But that message has been continuously uh, ignored by the Taliban and they having their own demands and now seemingly to have the 
a louder voice on the table and uh, gaining more and more uh, for their approach. So, so uh, as a researcher sort of ob observing the Taliban responses to this whole process, I see this excuse of, you know, changing the Afghan uh, state back to an M into an Emirate is more of a bargaining chip than an actual demand. It's more to increase the bargain and say, look, we are coming and look, we are capable of fearing you and creating violence. That's what is happening with the continuation of attacks, particularly targeting the civilians uh, across the country. So this is a message to say, look, we are still powerful and we are not yet in the negotiation. One thing that we learn from other experiences, as was mentioned in this panel and generally looking at them, is that such level of violence, unfortunately, continues until the day that there is an actual deal uh, by all sides. Uh, and it's evident in Afghanistan. It's extremely unfortunate and extremely annoying, but it's happening uh, uh, that we keep losing people on daily basis, uh, left and right, you know, north and south, east and west. Uh, and this uh, key thing here is to see a consistency from the Taliban side and their messaging. Otherwise, uh, their intentions are question questionable because the, the one major um, indicator to know uh, uh, Taliban and their power is their attacks and their military uh, capabilities are causing these uh, insecurities across the country. That's a fact. And then how they can sort of change that and switch that back into say, okay, we are here to make peace. They can prove it to, now they have proved it to their international counterparts uh, through the deal and through the release of prison prisoners. Their prisoners are in the process of being released and their demand is uh, responded. We just don't know what we have gained out of this because I have not gained anything as an Afghan. I can see my religious uh, scholars are being killed one after the other. I can see, uh, you know, young kids being targeted. I can see on daily basis. Look, I mean, I don't want to go into the violence, but I mean, these are evident. Right. So for Afghans so far, there is no like ordinary Afghans out of these sort of political elites who are made a promise that, OK, you are going to have a share of this cake one way or another. Your son will be in this team and your daughter will be in that team and things like that has, has been sort of made to them. But for an average ordinary Afghan, there is no concrete pro promise. Even reduction in violence didn't mean anything for Afghans. Why? Because we've lost. We have widows, we have orphans, and, and in that way, it's difficult to really see any uh, uh, seriousness to this point. And I hope that they are listening to what I'm saying at the moment. I don't see, as an average Afghan sort of I, I can speak of, uh, I don't see any seriousness in this process of ending violence. Uh, we have to be given uh, that level of trust to then be optimistic. Is that a uh, lack of seriousness or disunity? One of our uh, attendees has posed a question um, without mentioning his or her name that uh, the, there seems to be a reconciliation between President Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah, but the problem right now is this unity among the Taliban, specifically the attendee says, there are public reporting suggesting that there is a power struggle taking place within the Taliban their leadership has been weakened by the COVID-19. Uh, going on to say that Hebatullah Ahunzada, the Taliban leader, might have died, and Mola Yaqub has been pushed Sarajuddin Haqqani aside and taken as the actual de facto leader of the Taliban. Uh, are these claims holding any water? Is it, is it true, or is there a unity or coherent within the Taliban that uh, could result to uh, them as a group coming and negotiating with the Afghan government and all other interested parties in the Afghan peace process. Uh, did you want me to say? Please. And <laughs> although also to... Uh, although, well, what I'm going to say is this. Uh, first of all, I wish for, for that particular question, at least, or for other perspectives we share, that if we could have also some form of an a Taliban uh, uh, supporter in the, on the panel who could sort of, you know, be there to respond their side of the questions. Uh, now that we don't have, I don't, I, I as, a, as a researcher, as an individual, I don't have any specific uh, means of verification of whether this, this unity news is accurate or not. But one thing that will not make me surprised if it is, is the very fresh history in our hands in front of our eyes of the Mujahideen groups, 
look, all of them were also formed just before the Taliban in Pakistan in the war against the Soviets. And then what happened after the Soviets left? 1989, Soviets left. 1992, we had the worst civil war in the country through the region, regional players, but actually the, the actual implementing partners to this war were the Mujahideen factions. So why would the Taliban be, be entirely different from the Mujahideen factions? Of course, their masterminds, their major supporters would wish and desire that there is one Mullah Umar and there is one Mullah Haibatullah, everyone is following that and there is a Bayat system and all that. But, you know, uh, why I just can't find any reason for them to be entirely different. So the news of fractions within the Taliban is not new, according to some researchers. There has been disputes way before when the, the first time the disputes started when um, uh, late Mullah Omar, uh, their um, main leader passed away and they had no idea, and lots of their commanders had no idea of what happened. And following to that, the fractions were there. Uh, um, and, and, and I think still, uh, uh, we all, as Afghans, and I'm sure also as internationals as well, we are all living with um, a kind of a news that is fit to us through secondary sources when it comes to the Taliban's internal uh, uh, leadership uh, system. Uh, and, 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 and as an Afghan, uh, I mean, looking at the history and witnessing part of this history in my life uh, following the news, I find it quite difficult to buy uh, all these interpretation of how the leadership and Shurai Rahbari is operating because there is something that is not really uh, clear to, to, to us. So we hope that uh, this process of intra-Afghan dialogue uh, starts with actually giving uh, uh, you know, an organogram of uh, how, how things operate in the Taliban leadership. So we know who we are talking to and who is, uh, whether this person is having an authority to speak and have an authority on, on violence. Um, right. you know. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, Vanda, two questions from our audience, um, and I would like you to go and others might uh, also voice their opinions. We have one from Tangiz who says, what do you mean under limited U.S. presence and what could happen if the coalition forces leave Afghanistan? And related to that, how could the U.S. troops withdrawal affect the security and safety of ethnic minorities in Afghanistan, including Hazara people? Um, Wanda, why don't you take that uh, and unpack it? Like, what does it mean when Washington- sure, So I don't actually, I'm not certain that I said limited U.S. presence, but let me clarify it. Um, the U.S. commitment in uh, the, uh, 29 agreement is that all U.S. troops will be out of Afghanistan by July of next year. Now, in every country where the United States has an embassy, it has an embassy protection presence. Uh, the United States will not agree to have an embassy in Afghanistan without such uh, protection presence. And the Taliban is very keen to um, establish much better relations with the United States. It certainly believes that it will come to power in Afghanistan. It prefers to come to power and be the dominant actor in the Afghan government through uh, a combination of negotiations on military pressure rather than pressure alone, um, rather than military pressure alone, but it um, wants to then have um, improved relations with the United States and wants to make sure that US economic aid continues to flow to a government in which it is a member of or perhaps the dominant actor in. So that would all require an embassy. The US is not going to be sending economic um, aid to Afghanistan um, without an embassy presence. That means some military presence. The United States um, and many analysts in the United States had hoped uh, that uh, there could be some preservation of counterterrorism capability, uh, <coughs> of US counterterrorism capability that would allow the US to act against groups such as Al Qaeda and the Islamic State. Uh, one of the issues that was at stake in years before uh, Ambassador Kalazad took over the negotiations was whether the Taliban would uh, explicitly break with Al-Qaeda. Didn't happen even as part of the 29th deal. The Taliban disavowed um, terrorist activities overall, but did not specifically break with Al-Qaeda, a statement that is very costly to them. 
Nonetheless, the Taliban has also been very clearly opposed to any residual U.S. counterterrorism present. Uh, I, yeah, I could envision some ways this could in, in the future be um, open up again for discussion, but I'm not very optimistic that that would uh, nonetheless produce a substantial result. And any limited U.S. counterterrorism presence would need force protection. There are all kinds of ancillary issues uh, that come with that. So come next July, the U.S. will be in the position of either having gone down to zero or very close to it, or being in um, uh, abrogation of the deal that it signed with the Taliban, the U.S. can take the posture that the Taliban has promised to be negotiating, not that it has promised to reach a negotiated agreement, um, and that consequently the U.S. is really not violating the agreement, but it would certainly be violating what the Taliban expects. And But more broadly, uh, I just don't believe that there is very strong, significant U.S. support for um, any kind of staying that's more than a year or two, certainly I cannot envision any administration that four years from now, any US administration would want to have uh, the kind of conversation that the US is going through uh, today about US presence, that, that the US wants that to be long resolved before that. So maybe it's not July 2021, maybe it could be December 2021, but my view is that we are heading out. Okay. Uh, with our military presence. Um, but the U.S. wants to maintain diplomatic presence. It does not want Afghanistan to disintegrate into much more vicious version of a civil war. And the U.S. has committed itself to preserving economic aid. I do very much expect that the Taliban will be significantly militarily strengthened as the U.S. Uh, troops leave. Um, the reason why the Taliban has not been able to uh, hold on to provincial capitals when it has made uh, repeated uh, attacks on them has been fundamentally the presence of um, U.S. Air Force. Mm -hmm. uh, Afghan Air Force has uh, grown in capacity, but it's still nowhere comparable to uh, the level of U.S. capacities. And uh, Afghan Air Force is also very dependent on uh, U.S. Um, uh, technical repair uh, assistance. I would also, however, um, suggest here that while the Taliban has always been a conglomeration of different actors with different interests, the group has been really remarkable in the way it's been able to preserve unity and hierarchy and unity of effort. Uh, it has gone through multiple transitions, whether from Mullah Omar to Mullah Mansur, from Mansur to um, Haibatullah. Uh, the U.S. has spent 20 years of the effort to try to fragment and destroy uh, the unity of effort and the unity of structure of the Taliban and failed at that. Yes, there are different groups uh, and there might, if there is one day a peace agreement, there might be some factions that don't obey the split off from uh, the, the Islamic State is to some extent a split off from the Taliban, uh, but um, I would expect a group that has uh, going to be throwing a lot of military weight and challenging Afghan security forces far more dramatically than we have seen. And the longer it goes, the more uh, the difficulty, in my view, will be on the Afghan uh, military side, which again raises this excruciating dilemma of mm -hmm. how long one negotiate as the military battlefield is changing toward the Taliban potentially quite heftily. All right, thank you. Uh, a bunch of questions from our audience, but I would like Ambassador Andesha to uh, answer two questions that we got about the uh, regional issues and involvement of regional countries um, because he uh, uh, had some comments in his introductory remarks. Uh, we have one question from Farhad, uh, who says that recent Tashkent declaration was quite strong and promising statement of intentions and positions of states. It contained direct call addressed to the Taliban to stop fighting and go to negotiations. But just a few days after new terrorist actions were committed by Taliban who ignored that call. Uh, how would the speakers evaluate such a situation in terms of whether it's uh, realistic to expect the Taliban 
to respond in kind when such calls are made. And the second question we have is from one of our fellows, NE with the initials. Um, coming back to the region, as uh, was said, trade is one of the drivers to improve uh, economic integration. Hence, what's your prognosis when the situation at the border with Tajikistan will improve and fighters will stop escalating situation at the border areas? Hence, existing the, of the numerous bridges across Tajikistan. Afghanistan could be used to their full potential. Uh, concerns, potentials in the region, apart from uh, your usual suspects that have a stake in Afghanistan, US, uh, Pakistan, Iran, and China, our neighbors on the north. Okay, well, thank you. I think there's very, very good questions. And, uh, and in all of my you know, uh, interventions, I have intentionally kept the United States aside. And I'm taking the assumptions uh, which uh, uh, you know, has been seriously discussed in there that, that uh, there is the, the withdrawal of the United States uh, military is, uh, is imminent and, and irreversible, basically. Although we have seen this in 2015 Kunduz episode, which was uh, basically a return, but now uh, we, we should assume that, that, that that's the case and the United States will, uh, will depart. So under this assumption, my, you know, my uh, uh, discussion about region and regional influence was that uh, um, boiled down to two things. The region has two uh, options in front of mm. And of course, the region is much different uh, from what it was in the 1990s. You know, when, when we bring the question of 1990s and, and the civil war that happened, we have to evaluate it in the context of a region, the context of a Russia or Soviet Union disintegrating, India being busy with something. And, and, and you know, we were left only with Pakistan as the dominant force. And that's not this, that's, the configuration of region is not the same as it was in the, in the 1990s. So, I think we have to have a different understanding of what's going to transpire if even uh, uh, we are left uh, with, with the region. So region has two choices. And I think the most uh, um, uh, the positive one and, uh, and probably the one that, that they would like is to have a system, to have a future and a peace process within which the Taliban could be part of the uh, future Afghan, Afghanistan dispensation and that is in the interest. I just calculated it, you know, uh, that Iran has an interest in, in ending the, uh, this war and having a system where, you know, uh, Taliban is representing, giving some sort of relationship they have. And uh, the main extension is that, that you know, uh, the United States military will leave <coughs> Afghanistan if Taliban is part of the system. There's no more excuse according to them. For Central Asia, because of the trade and because of their security, it's their utmost interest for them to have a dispensation where you know the, the conflict is over and Taliban are part of the system where it's not necessary an, an, an Islamic Emirate, which, which is a base again for the fundamentalist group within Central Asia. I think that's clear. For Russia, again, you have seen you have, you have see it basically in the terms of their larger uh, uh, competition with the United States everywhere else. They they feel that you know having a, a, a negotiated settlement of Afghan issue where they will have a more say when the United States is, is, is uh, weakly represented in Afghanistan only by an embassy. So they will have an equal footing. They have an embassy with few Russian soldiers in it protecting their embassy and the United States will have the same. So then I think they'd be a different uh, dispensation. I think the only country which is, uh, China has the same thing. Of course, we know China's relationship with the Taliban. The only country which is left out of this equation is India, and you know they're also busy with so many other issues that they have themselves. Uh, so we uh, they could probably you know be okay if there is a balanced government in in Kabul. So, but then what is the other scenario? The other scenario is the worst case scenario, and in the worst case scenario is what the other speakers alluded to: is if the United States leaves, no matter what, or even if they leave in the middle of a negotiation where. Uh, uh, on the paper, things look fine, but then the Taliban are waiting their time and they just, you know, get in and, and, and they take over a number of uh, uh, provincial capitals. And what is going to happen? I think there are two things. One is the, uh, the, uh, the historical, you know, uh, memories that we have is, uh, you know, this question of Dr. Najibullah's regime has been brought into this question in the past. 
If you look at it, this Dr. Najibullah's regime uh, did not fall because the Soviet uh, troops were drawn. It fell because the Soviet Union actually fell. Like, you know, there was no way uh, to get the support. But, but the major element, which we forgot because we don't get into the nitty gritty, it was an internal disagreement within the Watan party at the time, which split the party in a way that they were hardliners who were waiting and thinking that, you know, the, uh, 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 the regime of, of Soviet Union could be reinvigorated somehow in Moscow. And they were thinking that Dr. Najibullah has been not uh, true to, you know, to all this uh, ideology that they were subscribed and they work with each other. So I mean the hardline communists. And then toward the end, he, you know, he lost control of the party itself. And with the party, the military apparatus. So if you look at Dr. Najib's thing, it was not basically because he promised or not, but it's just because he lost the grip in the domestic and the internal politics of his own party and his party he started talking to different stakeholders. And the Minister of Defense was in, 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 in uh, Chara Seal Lugar was talking to Igmatyar and some other minister of foreign affairs or the others were in the other side in, Jal in Jerusalem. So, so I think I don't see that situation here. But one thing is that, that I see that, that this situation, that the expectation of peace has created again an open moment for the politicians, for everyone in Afghanistan, that what I'm afraid is that if we are not going toward you know, a structure, well, that's why I was talking about the structure and the, and the process of peace, if we're not going toward a very structured peace process, then uh, instead of this process being you know, a unifier of what we call it, people who believe in the achievements of the past 20 years, they believe in the civil society and democratic system, including, you know, Mr. Ekma there was, uh, you, you, you mentioned that he's, he, he's saying that, you know, I'm, I'm an opposition because, you know, I'm a person who is in this election and he is not in the government. So that's why that makes me an opposition. So all of these forces, the peace could be a unifying factor, not a dividing factor within the structure of Afghanistan state that we are living. What's happening on the other side? Of course, again, it's in the interest of everyone, try to keep the Taliban as united as possible because you can have a peace process with a united group rather than a splinter group. And I think that's also in the interest of us in this side uh, to see, you know, we should expedite the process and we have to reach, you know, sort of, uh, sort of agreement. So I think right. we will boil down this. But in terms of the trade is also, as I said, you know, you look at the interests of the region, it's 100% in their interest to have peace, where their trade could open and they could open their potentials. Right. Otherwise, with the forces that now they have to keep peacekeeping, I mean, the, uh, uh, their border forces, including some Russian forces on their border, at that time, they will not have that problem. And, and the people that they are fighting right now or they're scared right now will change into some sort of, you know, friends and partners with whom they can do, they can do business. So right. I see that peace is very important for, for trade in Afghanistan and Central Asia, but an immediate opening of trade is important for sustainability of peace in Afghanistan. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Shwaib, I have two questions from Afghan fellows for you. Uh, limited time, uh, let's keep that in mind. I have a question from Mahmoud Nurzai and also from Basir Rusipi, and I'll uh, try to combine both of them. So uh, Taliban continues to instigate attacks across the country uh, that's the uh, Afghan government uses its leverage to bring pressure to the Taliban through U, uh, U.S. government and its envoy on peace affairs uh, as a means of ensuring that the Taliban are obeying their uh, Doha agreement. And uh, similar to that, I have uh, Basir's question, who says the Afghan government doesn't have uh, the ability or the past to abide by its promises and pledges, specifically naming the components of the national unity government for reforms that uh, were gone unmet and unachieved. Does it have uh, what it takes to continue a meaningful and substantial uh, peace talks as we move forward? I think that would be a good way to wrap this discussion and and the panel uh, with the limited time that we have. Two minutes, right for you. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think first to address the issue of violence. Of course, um, the whole entire point of the peace process is to end the conflict and end the war. And the next best thing, the closest thing to that is reduction in violence. We have seen bouts and periods 
where that commitment was delivered partially, either announced or unannounced. If the question is, do we use our leverage? Of course we do. Um, then the question is, how much leverage do you have to begin with? But what I can say is the, is the, the ceasefire in the Eid that just passed, it was an announced ceasefire by both sides, demonstrates uh, that these efforts are continually going on uh, by the government. But what, we, what we have to understand is uh, a psychology of a militancy. The psychology of militancy is that the conflict and the war has to continue for the militant, uh, uh, militant movement to not only have legitimacy, but to continue recruitment among and, and continue to be able to meet the fired rank demand of the field commanders. So it's very tough to ask them to stop uh, fighting, which is the main leverage that they have in their minds, and uh, step into a process. So it's a, it's a delicate balance to want to uh, uh, juggle between those two. On uh, um, the question of legitimacy, I think, I think credibility is relative. I understand that um, in terms of not being able to implement uh, political agreements internally, you take a hit. And, you know, that's, that's, that's a fair statement to make. But having said that, um, the general population prefers and demands a republic, which means they want to have a say in their future and in their own fate. And that was demonstrated in the consultative uh, lawyer Jirga, uh, or the National Grand Assembly, last year, and clearly outright um, uh, said that the Constitution needs to be preserved and we don't want the return of the Emirate. So you're right to say, where does the Afghan government um, get off to want to implement any potential agreement? Well, the question can be flipped, but at the same time, um, uh, at the end, and maybe as a final statement, what I'd like to highlight um, and remind everybody is that the, any peace process, and specifically this peace process of a four decade long conflict with different phases is extremely delicate um, and complicated and very, very vulnerable. Um, but what's important is a commitment to want to pursue it. And the Afghan government has demonstrated that commitment now, but we have to note that we pursued peace even when it was not popular with the United States and with the West. So it's not something that uh, is imposed because we want to end the war. There might be a difference of opinion in methods. There might be a difference of opinion on the way it's done and the details. But the fundamental principle is that we are the ones who are losing the most and have most at stake. Um, and we are the ones who want to end this conflict. I and think this that message is very clear time. that uh, more than anyone, uh, the people of Afghanistan, whether they are in uh, urban areas or rural villages, uh, more than anything, after years of conflict, they want peace and they want peace yesterday. And with that uh, clear message and with that uh, sense of hopefulness, even though, and despite all these challenges, I would like to um, thank all of our participants and uh, whether our panelists or our audience for their questions, insight and uh, the Rumsfeld Foundation that provided this uh, opportunity for us to, to take a deep dive at this very important issue that has consequences, uh, good or bad, uh, for the region and beyond. And with that, I would like to thank all of you for taking part. Have a good day, good evening or night, wherever you are, and stay safe and away from the COVID-19.